Biographical Sketch by Heinrich Heine, translated by Emma Lazarus, read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. Harry Heine, as he was originally named, was born in Düsseldorf on the Rhine, December thirteenth, seventeen ninety nine. His father was a well-to-do Jewish merchant, and his mother, the daughter of the famous physician and Alec Conler von Gerden, was, according to her son. A femme distingue. His early childhood fell in the days of the occupation of Dusseldorf by the French revolutionary troops, and, in the opinion of his biographer, Strotman, the influence of the French rule, thus brought directly to bear upon the formation of his character, can scarcely be exaggerated. His education was begun at the Franciscan monastery of the Jesuits at Dusseldorf where the teachers were mostly french priests and his religious instruction was at the same time carried on in a private jewish school his principal companions were jewish children and he was brought up with a rigid adherence to the hebrew faith thus in the very seed time of his mental development were simultaneously sown the germs of that gallic liveliness and mobility which preeminently distinguish him among german authors and also of his ineradicable sympathy with things jewish and his inveterate antagonism to the principles and results of christianity as the medical profession was in those days the only one open to jews in germany the boy heine was destined for a commercial career and in eighteen fifteen his father took him to frankfurt to establish him in a banking house but a brief trial proved that he was utterly unsuited to the situation and after two months he was back again in Düsseldorf. Three years later he went to Hamburg, and made another attempt to adopt a mercantile pursuit, under the auspices of his uncle, the wealthy banker, Solomon Heine. The millionaire, however, was very soon convinced that the fool of a boy would never be fit for a counting-house, and declared himself willing to furnish his nephew with the means for a three years' course at the university in order to obtain a doctor's degree and practice law in hamburg it was well known that this would necessitate harry's adoption of christianity but his proselytism did not strike those whom it most nearly concerned in the same way as it has impressed the world so far from this being the case he wrote in eighteen twenty three to his friend moza here the question of baptism enters none of my family is opposed to it except myself but this myself is of a peculiar nature with my mode of thinking you can imagine that the mere act of baptism is indifferent to me that even symbolically i do not consider it of any importance and that i shall only dedicate myself more entirely to upholding the rights of my unhappy brethren but nevertheless i find it beneath my dignity and a taint upon my honour to allow myself to be baptized in order to hold office in prussia i understand very well the psalmist's words good god give me my daily bread that i may not blaspheme thy name the uncle's offer was accepted in eighteen nineteen harry heine entered the university of bonn during his stay in hamburg began his unrequited passion for a cousin who lived in that city a passion which inspired a large portion of his poetry and indeed gave the keynote to his whole tone and spirit he sings so many different versions of the same story of disappointment that it is impossible to ascertain with all his frank and passionate confidences the true course of the affair after a few months at bonn he removed to the university of Göttingen, which he left in eighteen twenty two for berlin there is no other period in the poet's career on which it is so pleasant to linger as on the two years of his residence in the prussian capital in his first prose work the letters from berlin published in the rhenish westphalian indicator he has painted a vivid picture of the life and gaiety of the city during its most brilliant season at the last rout i was particularly gay i was so beside myself that i really do not know why i did not walk on my head if my most mortal enemy had crossed my path i should have said to him to-morrow we will kill each other 
but to-night i will cordially cover you with kisses tu es beau tu es charmant tu es l'objet de ma flamme et je dors ma belle these were the words my lips repeated instinctively a hundred times and i pressed everybody's hand and i took off my hat gracefully to everybody and all the men returned my civilities only one german youth played the boar and railed against what he called my aping the manners of the foreign babylon and growled out in his old teutonic beer-drinking bass voice at a german masquerade a german should speak a german oh german youth how thy words strike me as not only silly but almost blasphemous at such moments when my soul lovingly embraces the entire universe when i would fain joyfully embrace russians and turks and throw myself in tears on the breast of my brother the enslaved african the doors of the most delightful intellectual society of germany were opened to the handsome young poet who is described in a contemporary sketch as beardless blond and pale without any prominent feature in his face but of so peculiar a stamp that he attracted the attention at once and was not readily forgotten the daughter of elisa von holnhausen the translator of byron has given us a charming sketch of her mother's thursday evening receptions which heine regularly attended and where he read aloud the unpublished manuscripts of his lyrical intermezzo and his tragedies almansor and ratcliffe he was obliged to submit writes mademoiselle von holnhausen to many a harsh criticism to much severe censure above all he was subjected to a great deal of chaffing about his poetic sentimentality which a few years later awakened so warm a response in the hearts of german youth the poem ending zu deinen süßen füßen at thy sweet feet met with such laughing opposition that he omitted it from the published edition opinions of his talents were various a small minority had any suspicion of his future undisputed poetical fame elisa von holnhausen who gave him the name of the german byron met with many contradictions this recognition however assured her an imperishable gratitude on heine's part not only his social and intellectual faculties found abundant stimulus in this bracing atmosphere but his moral convictions were directed and strengthened by the philosophy and personal influence of hegel and his sympathies with his own race were aroused to enthusiastic activity by the intelligent jews who were at that time laboring in berlin for the advancement of their oppressed brethren in eighteen nineteen had been formed the society for the culture and improvement of the jews which though centred in berlin counted members all over prussia as well as in vienna copenhagen and new york heine joined it in eighteen twenty two and became one of its most influential members in the educational establishment of the verein he gave for several months three hours of historical instruction a week he frankly confessed that he the born enemy of all positive religions was no enthusiast for the hebrew faith but he was none the less eager to proclaim himself an enthusiast for the rights of the jews and their civil equality during his brief visit to frankfurt he had had personal experience of the degrading conditions to which his people were subjected the contrast between his choice of residence for twenty-five years in paris and the tenacity with which goethe clung to his home is not as strongly marked as the contrast between the relative positions in frankfurt of these two men goethe the grandson of the honored chief magistrate surrounded in his cheerful burgher life as carlyle says by kind plenty secure affection manifold excitement and instruction might well cherish golden memories of his native city for him the gloomy judengasse which he occasionally passed where quote, squalid painful hebrews were banished to scour old clothes unquote, was but a dark spot that only heightened the prevailing brightness of the picture 
but to this wretched byway was relegated that other beauty enamoured artist soul heine when he dared set foot in the imperial free town here he must be locked in like a wild beast with his miserable brethren every sunday afternoon and if the restrictions were a little less barbarous in other parts of germany yet how shall we characterize a national policy which closed to such a man as heine every career that could give free play to his genius and offered him the choice between money changing and medicine it was not till he had exhausted every means of endeavouring to secure a remission of the humiliating decree that he consented to the public act of apostasy and was baptized in the summer of eighteen twenty five in the lutheran parsonage of heiligenstadt with the name of johann christian heinrich during the period of his earnest labours for judaism he had buried himself with fervid zeal in the lore of his race and had conceived the idea of a prose legend the rabbi of bacharach illustrating the persecutions of his people during the middle ages accounts vary as to the fate of this work some affirm that the manuscript was destroyed at a fire in hamburg and others that the three chapters which the world possesses are all that were ever completed heine one of the most subjective of poets treats this theme in a purely objective manner he does not allow himself a word of comment much less of condemnation concerning the outrages he depicts he paints the scene as an artist not as the passionate fellow sufferer and avenger that he is but what subtle eloquence lurks in that restrained cry of horror and indignation which never breaks forth and yet which we feel through every line gathering itself up like thunder on the horizon for a terrific outbreak at the end would that we could hear the explosion burst at last we long for it throughout as the climax and the necessary result of the lowering electric influences of the story and we lay aside the never-to-be-completed fragment with the oppression of a nightmare but a note of such tremendous power as heine had struck in this romance required for its prolonged sustention a singleness of purpose and an exaltation of belief in its efficacy and truth which he no longer possessed after his renunciation of judaism he was no longer at one with himself for no sooner was the irrevocable step taken than it was bitterly repented not as a recantation of his principles for as such no one who follows the development of his mind can regard it but as an unworthy concession to tyrannic injustice how sensitive he remained in respect to the whole question is proved most conspicuously by his refraining on all occasions from signing his christian name heinrich even his works he caused to appear under the name of h heine and was once extremely angry with his publisher for allowing by mistake the full name to be printed the collection of poems in prose and verse known as the reisebilder embraced several years of heine's literary activity and represent widely varying phases of his intellectual development we need only turn to the volumes themselves to guess how bitter an experience must have filled the gap between the buoyant stream of sunny inspiration that ripples through the Hartzreise and the fierce spirit of vindictive malice which prompted heine six years later to conclude his third and last volume with his unseemly diatribe against count platten notwithstanding their inequalities the reisebilder remains one of the surest props of heine's fame so clear and perfect an utterance is sufficiently rare in all languages but it becomes little short of a miracle when as in this case the medium of its transmission is german prose a vehicle so bulky and unwieldy that no one before heine had dared to enlist it in the service of airy fantasy delicate humour and sparkling wit during the summer of eighteen thirty while he was loitering at helgoland he was roused to feverish excitement by the news of the july revolution he inveighed against the nobility in a preface to a pamphlet called kaldorf on the nobility which largely increased the number of his powerful enemies the literary censorship had long mutilated his prose writings 
besides materially diminishing his legitimate income by prohibiting the sale of many of his works he now began to fear that his personal liberty would be restricted as summarily as his literary activity and in may eighteen thirty one he took up his residence in paris he perfected himself in the french language and by his brilliant essays on french art german philosophy and the romantic school soon acquired the reputation of one of the best prose writers of france and the wittiest frenchman since voltaire he became deeply interested in the doctrine of saint simonism then at its culminating point in paris its central idea of the rehabilitation of the flesh and the sacredness of labor found an enthusiastic champion in him who had so long denounced the impracticable spiritualism of christianity he the logical clear-headed skeptic in all matters pertaining to existing systems and creeds seems possessed with the credulity of a child in regard to every scheme of human regeneration or shall we call it the exaltation of the jew for whom the messiah has not yet arrived but is none the less confidently and hourly expected embittered by repeated disappointments by his enforced exile by a nervous disease which had afflicted him from his youth and was now fast gaining upon him and by the impending shadow of actual want heine's tone now assumes a concentrated acridity and his poetry acquires a reckless audacity of theme and treatment his neue lied addressed to notorious parisian women were regarded as an insult to decency in literary merit many of them vie with the best of his earlier songs but the daring defiance of public opinion displayed in the choice of subject excluded all other criticism than that of indignation and rebuke there is but a single ray to lighten the gathering gloom of heine's life at this period in a letter dated april eleventh eighteen thirty five occurs his first mention of his liaison with the grisette mathilde crescence mira who afterwards became his wife this uneducated simple-hearted affectionate child-wife inspired in the poet weary of intellectual strife a love as tender and constant as it had been sudden and passionate a variety of circumstances having combined to reduce heine to extreme want he had recourse to a step which has been very severely censured he applied for and received from the french government a pension from the fund set aside for quote, all those who by their zeal for the cause of the revolution had more or less compromised themselves at home or abroad unquote. now that the particulars of the case are so well known it would be superfluous to add any words of justification it can only excite our sympathy for the haughty poet doomed to drain so bitter a cup he was pressed to take the oath of naturalization but he had too painful experience of the renunciation of his birthright ever to consent to a repetition of his error he would not forfeit the right to have inscribed upon his tombstone here lies a german poet in eighteen forty four his uncle solomon died and as there was no stipulation in the banker's will that the yearly allowance hitherto granted to heinrich should continue the oldest heir karl announced that this would altogether cease this very cousin karl had been nursed by heine at the risk of his own life during the cholera plague of eighteen thirty two in paris the grief and excitement caused by his kinsman's ingratitude fearfully accelerated the progress of the malady which had long been gaining upon the poet and which proved to be a softening of the spinal cord one eye was paralyzed he lost the sense of taste and complained that everything he ate was like clay his physicians agreed that he had few weeks to live and he felt that he was dying little divining that the agony was to be prolonged for ten horrible years it is unnecessary to dwell upon these years of darkness in which heine shrivelled to the proportions of a child languished upon his mattress grave in paris his patient resignation his indomitable will his sweetness and gaiety of temper and his unimpaired vigour and fertility of intellect 
are too fresh in the memory of many living witnesses and have been too frequently and recently described to make it needful here to enlarge upon them in the crucial hour he proved no recreant to the convictions for which he had battled and bled during a lifetime of the report that his illness had materially modified his religious opinions he has left a complete and emphatic denial i must expressly contradict the rumour that i have retreated to the threshold of any sort of church or that i have reposed upon its bosom no my religious views and convictions have remained free from all churchdom no belfry chime has allured me no altar taper has dazzled me i have trifled with no symbol and have not utterly renounced my reason i have forsworn nothing not even my old pagan gods from whom it is true i have parted but parted in love and friendship i am no longer a divine biped he wrote i am no longer the freest german after goethe as ruge has named me in healthier days i am no longer the great hero number two who was compared with the grape-crowned dionysius whilst my colleague number one enjoyed the title of a grand ducal weimarian jupiter i am no longer a joyous somewhat corpulent hellenist laughing cheerfully down upon the melancholy nazarenes i am now a poor fatally ill jew an emaciated picture of woe an unhappy man thus side by side flowed on the continuous streams of that wit and pathos which he poured forth inexhaustibly to the very end no word of complaint or impatience ever passed his lips on the contrary with his old irresistible humour his fancy played about his own privations and sufferings and tried to alleviate for his devoted wife and friends the pain of the heart-rending spectacle his delicate consideration prompted him to spare his venerable mother all knowledge of his illness he wrote to her every month in his customary cheerful way and in sending her the latest volumes of his poetry he caused a separate copy always to be printed from which all allusions to his malady were expunged for that matter he said that any son could be as wretched and miserable as i no mother would believe alas if he had known how much more eloquent and noble a refutation his life would afford than his mistaken passionate response to the imputations of his enemies is this patient martyr the man of whom borna wrote with his sybarite nature the fall of a rose-leaf can disturb heine's slumber he whom all asperities fatigue whom all discords trouble let such a one neither move nor think let him go to bed and shut his eyes only in his last poems which were not to be published till after his death has heine given free vent to the bitterness of his anguish during the long sleepless night when he lay writhing with pain or exhausted by previous paroxysms his mind preternaturally clear and vigorous conceived the glowing fantasies of the roman chero or the job-like lamentations of the lazarus poems this mental exercise was his protection against insanity and the thought of his cherished wife he affirmed was his only safeguard against the delirious desire to seize the morphine bottle by his side and with one draught put an end to his agony on the night of the sixteenth of february eighteen fifty six came the long craved release and on the twentieth of february without mass or kaddish according to his express wish he was buried in the cemetery of montmartre end of section this recording is in the public domain sonnets to my mother b heine ne von geldern by heinrich heine translated by emma lazarus read for librivox .org by algie pug one i have been wont to bear my forehead high my stubborn temper yields with no good grace the king himself might look me in the face and yet i would not downcast mine eye but i confess dear mother openly 
however proud my haughty spirit swell when i within thy blessed presence dwell oft am i smit with shy humility is it thy soul with secret influence thy lofty soul piercing all shows of sense which soareth heaven-born to heaven again or springs it from sad memories that tell how many a time i caused thy dear heart pain thy gentle heart that loveth me so well two in fond delusion once i left thy side unto the wide world's end i fain would fare to see if i might find love anywhere and lovingly embrace love as a bride love sought i in all paths at every gate oft and again outstretching suppliant palms i begged in vain of love the slightest arms but the world laughed and offered me cold hate for ever i aspired towards love for ever towards love and ne'ertheless i found love never and sick at heart homeward my steps did move and lo thou comest forth to welcome me and that which in thy swimming eyes i see that is the precious the long looked for love end of poem this recording is in the public domain the sphinx by heinrich heine translated by emma lazarus read for librivox dot org by algy pug and newgate novelist this is the old enchanted wood sweet lime trees scent the wind the glamour of the moon has cast a spell upon my mind onward i walk and as i walk hark to that high soft strain that is the nightingale she sings of love and of love's pain she sings of love and of love's pain of laughter and of tears so plaintive her carol so joyous her sobs i dream of forgotten years onward i walk and as i walk there stands before mine eyes a castle proud on an open lawn whose gables high uprise with casements closed and everywhere sad silence in court and halls it seemed as though mute death abode within those barren walls before the doorway crouched a sphinx half horror and half grace with a lion's body a lion's claws and a woman's breast and face a woman fair the marble glance spake wild desire and guile the silent lips were proudly curled in a confident glad smile the nightingale she sang so sweet i yielded to her tone i touched i kissed the lovely face and lo i was undone the marble image stirred with life the stone began to move she drank my fiery kisses glow with panting thirsty love she well nigh drank my breath away and lustful still for more embraced me and my shrinking flesh with lion claws she tore oh rapturous martyrdom ravishing pain oh infinite anguish and bliss with her horrible talons she wounded me while she thrilled my soul with a kiss the nightingale sang o oh, beautiful sphinx o oh, love what meaneth this that thou minglest still the pangs of death with thy most peculiar bliss thou beautiful sphinx o oh, solve for me this riddle of joy and tears i have pondered it over again and again how many thousand years end of poem this recording is in the public domain donna clara by heinrich heine translated by emma lazarus read for librivox dot org by algy pug and newgate novelist
in the evening through her garden wanders the alcade's daughter festal sounds of drum and trumpet ring out hither from the castle i am weary of the dances honeyed words of adulation from the knights who still compare me to the sun with dainty phrases yes of all things i am weary since i first beheld by moonlight him my cavalier whose zither nightly draws me to my casement as he stands so slim and daring with his flaming eyes that sparkle from his nobly pallid features truly he st george resembles thus went donna clara dreaming on the ground her eyes were fastened when she raised them lo before her stood the handsome knightly stranger pressing hands and whispering passion these twain wander in the moonlight gently doth the breeze caress them the enchanted roses greet them the enchanted roses greet them and they glow like love's own heralds tell me tell me my beloved wherefore all at once thou blushest gnats were stinging me my darling and i hate these gnats in summer e'en as though they were a rabble of vile jews with long hooked noses heed not gnats nor jews beloved spake the knight with fond endearments from the almond tree dropped downward myriad snowy flakes of blossoms myriad snowy flakes of blossoms shed around them fragrant odours tell me tell me my beloved looks thy heart on me with favour yes i love thee o oh my darling and i swear it by our saviour whom the accursed jews did murder long ago with wicked malice heed thou neither jews nor saviour spake the knight with fond endearments far off waved as in a vision gleaming lilies bathed in moonlight gleaming lilies bathed in moonlight seemed to watch the stars above them tell me tell me my beloved didst thou not erewhile swear falsely naught is false in me my darling e'en as in my bosom floweth not a drop of blood that's moorish neither of foul jewish current heed not moors nor jews beloved spake the knight with fond endearments then towards a grove of myrtles leads he the alcada's daughter and with love's slight subtle meshes he hath trapped her and entangled brief their words but long their kisses for their hearts are overflowing what a melting bridal carol sings the nightingale the pure one how the fireflies in the grasses trip their sparkling torchlight dances in the grove the silence deepens naught is heard save furtive rustling of the swaying myrtle branches and the breathing of the flowers but the sound of drum and trumpet burst forth sudden from the castle rudely they awaken clara pillowed on her lover's bosom hark they summon me my darling but before i go oh tell me tell me what thy precious name is which so closely thou hast hidden and the knight with gentle laughter kissed the fingers of his donna kissed her lips and kissed her forehead and at last these words he uttered i signora your beloved am the son of the respected worthy erudite grand rabbi israel of saragossa end of poem this recording is in the public domain Don Ramiro by Heinrich Heine, translated by Emma Lazarus, read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug and Newgate Novelist. Donna Clara, Donna Clara, hotly loved through years of passion, thou hast wrought me mine undoing, and hast wrought it without mercy. Donna Clara, Donna Clara, still the gift of life is pleasant, but beneath the earth tis frightful in the grave so cold and darksome donna clara laugh be merry 
for to-morrow shall fernando greet thee at the nuptial altar wilt thou bid me to the wedding don ramiro don ramiro very bitter sounds thy language bitterer than the stars decrees are which bemock my heart's desire don ramiro don ramiro cast aside thy gloomy temper in the world are many maidens but us twain the lord hath parted don ramiro thou who bravely many and many a man hast conquered conquer now thyself to-morrow come and greet me at my wedding donna clara donna clara yes i swear it i am coming i will dance with thee the measure now good night i come to-morrow so good night the casement rattled sighing neath it stood ramiro long he stood a stony statue then amid the darkness vanished after long and weary struggling night must yield unto the daylight like a many-coloured garden lies the city of toledo palaces and stately fabrics shimmer in the morning sunshine and the lofty domes of churches glitter as with gold encrusted humming like a swarm of insects ring the bells their festal carol with sweet tones the sacred anthem from each house of god ascendeth but behold behold beyond there yonder from the market chapel with a billowing and a swaying streams a motley throng of people gallant knights and noble ladies in their holiday apparel while the pealing bells ring clearly and the deep-voiced organ murmurs but a reverential passage in the people's midst is opened for the richly clad young couple donna clara don fernando to the bridegroom's palace threshold wind the waving throngs of people there the wedding feast beginneth pompous in the olden fashion nightly games and open table interspersed with joyous laughter quickly flying speed the hours till the night again hath fallen and the wedding guests assemble for the dance within the palace and their many-coloured raiment glitters in the light of tapers seated on a lofty dais side by side a bride and bridegroom donna clara don fernando and they murmur sweet love whispers and within the hall wave brightly all the gay decked stream of dancers and the rolling drums are beaten shrill the clamorous trumpet soundeth wherefore wherefore beauteous lady are thy lovely glances fastened yonder in the hall's far corner in amazement asked fernando seest thou not o don fernando yonder man in sable mantle and the knight spake kindly smiling why it is nothing but a shadow but the shadow drew anear them twas a man in sable mantle clara knows at once ramiro and she greets him blushing crimson and the dance begins already gaily whirl around the dancers in the waltz's reckless circles till the firm floor creaks and trembles yes with pleasure don ramiro i will dance with thee the measure but in such a night-black mantle thou shouldst never have come hither with fixed piercing eyes ramiro gazes on the lovely lady then embracing her speaks strangely at thy bidding i came hither in the wild whirl of the measure press and turn the dancing couple and the rolling drums are beaten shrill the clamorous trumpet soundeth white as driven snow thy cheeks are whispers clara inly trembling at thy bidding i came hither hollow ring ramiro's accents in the hall the tapers flicker with the eddying stream of dancers and the rolling drums are beaten shrill the clamorous trumpet soundeth cold as ice i feel thy fingers whispers clara thrilled with terror at thy bidding i came hither and they rush on in the vortex 
leave me leave me don ramiro like a corpse's scent thy breath is once again the gloomy sentence at thy bidding i came hither and the firm floor glows and rustles merry sound the horns and fiddles like a woof of strange enchantment all within the hall is whirling leave me leave me don ramiro all is waving and revolving don ramiro still repeateth at thy bidding i came hither in the name of god be gone then clara shrieked with steadfast accent and the word was scarcely spoken when ramiro had envanished clara stiffens deathly pallid numb with cold with night encompassed in a swoon the lovely creature to the shadowy realm is wafted but the misty slumber passes and at last she lifts her eyelids then again from sheer amazement her fair eyes at once she closes for she sees she hath not risen since the dance's first beginning still she sits beside the bridegroom and he speaks with anxious question say why wax thy cheek so pallid wherefore fill thine eyes with shadows and ramiro stammers clara and her tongue is glued with horror but with deep and serious furrows is the bridegroom's forehead wrinkled lady ask not bloody tidings don ramiro died this morning end of poem this recording is in the public domain Tannhäuser, a legend. Tannhäuser by Heinrich Heine, translated by Emma Lazarus, read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. One. Good Christians all, be not entrapped in Satan's cunning snare. I sing the lay of Tannhäuser to bid your souls beware. Brave Tannhäuser, a noble knight, would love and pleasure win. These lured him to the Venusberg seven years he bode therein dame venus loveliest of dames farewell my life my bride oh give me leave to part from thee no longer may i bide my noble knight my tannhäuser thou kiss me not to-day come kiss me quick and tell me now what lacks thou here i pray have i not poured the sweetest wine daily for thee my spouse and have i not with roses dear each day enwreathed to thy brows dame venus loveliest of dames my soul is sick i swear of kisses roses and sweet wine and craveth bitter fare we have laughed and jested far too much and i yearn for tears this morn would that my head no rose wreath wore but a crown of sharpest thorn my noble knight my tannhäuser to vex me thou art fain hast thou not sworn a thousand times to leave me never again come to my chamber let us go our love shall be secret there and thy gloomy thoughts shall vanish at sight of my lily-white body fair dame venus loveliest of dames immortal thy charms remain as many have loved thee ere to-day so many shall love again but when i think of the heroes and gods who feasted long ago upon thy lily-white body fair then sad at heart i grow thy lily-white body filleth me with loathing for i see how many more in years to come shall enjoy thee after me my noble knight my tannhäuser such words thou shouldst not say far liefer had i thou dealt'st me a blow as often ere this day far liefer had i thou shouldst strike me low than such an insult speak cold thankless christian that thou art thus the pride of my heart to break because i have loved thee far too well to hear such words is my fate farewell i give thee free leave to go myself i open the gate two in rome in rome the holy town to the music of chimes and of song a stately procession moves the pope strides in the midst of the throng this is the pious pope urbane the triple crown he wears the crimson robe and many a lord 
the train of his garment bears o holy father pope urbane i have a tale to tell i stir not hence till thou shrivest me and savest me from hell the people stand in a circle near and the priestly anthems cease who is the pilgrim wan and wild who falleth upon his knees o holy father pope urbane who can spind and loose as well now save me from the evil one and from the pains of hell i am the noble tannhauser who love and lust would win these lured me to the venusberg seven years i bode therein dame venus is a beauteous dame her charms have a subtle glow like sunshine with fragrance of flowers blent is her voice so soft and low as the butterfly flutters anigh a flower from its delicate chalice sips in such wise ever fluttered my soul anigh to her rosy lips her rich black ringlets floating loose her noble face in wreath when once her large eyes rest on thee thou canst not stir nor breathe when once her large eyes rest on thee with chains thou art bound and fast twas only in sorest need i chanced to flee from her hill at last from her hill at last i have escaped but through all the live-long day those beautiful eyes still follow me come back they seem to say a lifeless ghost all day i pine but at night i dream of my bride and then my spirit awakes in me she laughs and sits by my side how hearty how happy how reckless her laugh how the pearly white teeth out peep ah when i remember that laugh of hers then sudden tears must i weep i love her i love her with all my might and nothing my love can stay tis like to a rushing cataract whose force no man can sway for it dashes on from cliff to cliff and roareth and foameth still though it break its neck a thousand times its course it would yet fulfil were all of the boundless heavens mine i would give them all to her i would give her the sun i would give her the moon and each star in its shining sphere i love her i love her with all my might with the flame that devoureth me can these be already the fires of hell that shall glow eternally o oh, holy father pope urbane who canst bind and loose as well now save me from the evil one and from the pains of hell sadly the pope upraised his hand and sadly began to speak tannhäuser most wretched of all men this spell thou canst not break the devil called venus is the worst amongst all we name as such and never more canst thou be redeemed from the beautiful witch's clutch thou with thy spirit must atone for the joys thou hast loved so well accursed art thou thou art condemned unto everlasting hell three so quickly fared sir tannhäuser his feet were bleeding and torn back to the venusberg he came ere the earliest streak of morn dame venus awakened from her sleep from her bed upsprang in haste already she hath with her arms so white her darling spouse embraced forth from her nose out streams the blood the tears from her eyelids start she moistens the face of her darling spouse with the tears and blood of her heart the knight lay down upon her bed and not a word he spake dame venus to the kitchen went a bowl of broth to make she gave him broth she gave him bread she bathed his wounded feet she combed for him his matted hair and laughed so low and sweet my noble knight my tannhauser long hast thou left my side now tell me in what foreign land so long thou couldst abide dame venus loveliest of dames i tarried far from home in rome i had some business dear but quickly back have come on seven hills great rome is built the tiber flows to the sea and while in rome i saw the pope he sent his love to thee through florence led my journey home through milan too i passed and glad at heart through switzerland i clambered back at last but as i went across the alps the snow began to fall below the blue lake smiled on me i heard the eagles call 
when i upon st gothard stood i heard the germans snore for softly slumbered there below some thirty kings and more to frankfurt i on schobas came where dumplings were my food they have the best religion there goose giblets too are good in weimar the widowed muse's seat midst general grief i arrive the people are crying gert is dead and eckerman still alive note there are eight more verses to this poem which i take the liberty of omitting emma lazarus end of poem this recording is in the public domain in the underworld by heinrich heine translated by emma lazarus read for LibriVox.org by algie pug and newgate novelist one oh to be a bachelor pluto now for ever sighs in my marriage miseries i perceive without a wife hell was not a hell before oh to be a bachelor since my proserpine is mine daily from my grave i pine when she raileth i can hear barking cerberus no more my poor heart needs rest and ease in the realm of shades i cry no lost soul is sad as i sisyphus i envy now and the fair Danaides. two in the realm of shades on a throne of gold by the side of her royal spouse behold fair proserpine with gloomy mien while deep sighs upheave her bosom the roses the passionate song i miss of the nightingale yea and the sun's warm kiss midst the lemur's dread and the ghostly dead now withers my life's young blossom i am fast in the yoke of marriage bound to this cursed rat-hole underground through my window at night peers each ghostly sprite and the sticks murmurs lower and lower to-day i have Karen invited to dinner he is bald and his limbs they grow thinner and thinner and the judges beside of the dead dismal eyed in such company i shall grow sour three whilst their grievance each is venting in the underworld below ceres on the earth lamenting wrathful wanders to and fro with no hood in sloven fashion neither mantle o'er her gown she declaims that lamentation unto all of us well known is the blessed springtide here has the earth again grown young green the sunny hills appear and the icy band is sprung mirrored from the clear blue river zeus unclouded laugheth out softer zephyr's wings now quiver buds upon the fresh twigs sprout in the hedge a new refrain call the oreads from the shore all thy flowers come again but thy daughter comes no more ah how many weary days i have sought o'er wide earth's space titan all thy sunny rays i have sent on her dear trace yet not one renews assurance of the darling face i wot day that finds all things the durance of my lost one findeth not hast thou ravished zeus my daughter or love smitten by her charms hath or orcus night black water pluto snatched her in his arms who towards that gloomy strand herald of my grief will be ever floats the bark from land bearing phantoms ceaselessly closed those shadowy fields are ever unto any blessed sight since the styx hath been a river it hath borne no living white there are thousand stairs descending but not one leads upward there to her tears no token lending at the anxious mother's prayer four o oh, my mother-in-law ceres cease thy cries no longer mourn i will grant thee what so dear is 
I myself so much have borne. Take thou comfort. We will fairly thy child's ownership divide, and for six moons shall she yearly in the upper world abide. Help thee through long summer hours in thy husbandry affairs, binding up for thee the flowers while a new straw hat she wears. She will dream when twilight pleasant colours all the sky with rose, when by brooks some clownish peasant sweetly on his sheep's pipe blows. Not a harvest dance without her, she will frisk with Jack and Bess, midst the geese and calves about her she will prove a lioness. Hail, sweet rest! I breathe free, single, here in Orcus, far from strife. Punch with Lethe I will mingle, and forget I have a wife. 5. At times thy glance appeareth to importune, as though thou didst some secret longing prove. Alas, too well I know it, thy misfortune, a life frustrated, a frustrated love. How sad thine eyes are! Yet have I no power to give thee back thy youth with pleasure rife. Incurably thy heart must ache each hour for love frustrated and frustrated life. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Veil of Tears by Heinrich Heine. Translated by Emma Lazarus. Read for LibriVox.org by Rhys Harrison. The night wind through the crannies pipes, and in the garret lie. Two wretched creatures on the straw, as gaunt as poverty. And one poor creature speaks and says, Embrace me with thine arm, and press thy mouth against my mouth, thy breath will keep me warm. The other starveling speaks and says, When I look into thine eyes, pain, cold, and hunger disappear and all my miseries. They kissed full oft, still more they wept, clasped hands, sighed deep and fast. They often laughed, they even sang, and both were still at last. With morning came the coroner, and brought a worthy leech, on either corpse to certify the cause of death of each. The nipping weather, he affirmed, had finished the deceased, their empty stomachs also caused or hastened death at last. He added that when frost sets in, it is needful that the blood be warmed with flannels one should have. Moreover, wholesome food. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Solomon by Heinrich Heimer Translated by Emma Lazarus and read for LibriVox.org by Rhys Harrison. Dumb are the trumpets, cymbals, drums, and shawms tonight. The angel shapes engirdled with the sword. About the royal tent keep watch and ward. Six thousand to the left, six thousand to the right. They guard the king from evil dreams, from death. Behold, a frown across his brow they view. Then all at once, like glimmering flame steel blue, twelve thousand brandished swords leap from the sheaf. But back into their scabbards drop the swords of the angelic host, the midnight pain have vanished. The king's brow is smooth again, and hark, a royal sleeper's murmured words. O Shulamite, the lord of all these lands am I. This empire is the heritage I bring. For I am Judah's king and Israel's king, but if thou love me not, I languish and I die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Morphine by Heinrich Heine. Translated by Emma Lazarus and read for LibriVox.org by Rhys Harrison. Marked is the likeness twixt the beautiful and youthful brothers, albeit one appear far paler than the other, more serene, yea, I might almost say far comelier than his dear brother, who so lovingly embraced me in his arms. 
How tender, soft seemed then his smile, and how divine his glance. No wonder that the reef of poppy flowers about his head brought comfort to my brow, and with its mystic fragrance soothed all pain from out my soul. But such delicious balm a little while could last. I can be cured completely only when that other youth, the grave, pale brother, drops at last his torch. Lo, sleep is good, better is death, in sooth the best of all were never to be born. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by Heinrich Heine, translated by Emma Lazarus, read for LibriVox.org by Caroline. Song Oft in galleries of art thou hast seen a knight perchance, eager for the wars to start, well equipped with shield and lance. Him the frolic loves have found, robbed him of his sword and spear, and with chains of flowers have bound their unwilling chevalier held by such sweet hindrances wreathed with bliss and pain i stay while my comrades in the press wage the battle of the day end of poem this recording is in the public domain Song by Heinrich Heine, translated by Emma Lazarus, read for LibriVox.org by Caroline. Song Night lay upon my eyelids, about my lips earth clave, with stony heart and forehead I lay within my grave. How long I cannot reckon I slept in that straight bed, I woke and heard distinctly a knocking overhead wilt thou not rise my henry the eternal dawn is here the dead have re-arisen immortal bliss is near i cannot rise my darling i am blinded to the day mine eyes with tears thou knowest have wept themselves away oh i will kiss them henry kiss from thine eyes the night thou shalt behold the angels and the celestial light i cannot rise my darling my blood is still outpoured where thou didst wound my heart once with sharp and cruel word i'll lay my hand dear henry upon thy heart again then shall it cease from bleeding and stilled shall be its pain i cannot rise my darling my head is bleeding see i shot myself thou knowest when thou was reft from me oh with my hair dear henry i'll staunch the cruel wound and press the blood-stream backward thou shalt be whole and sound so kind so sweet she wooed me i could not say her nay i tried to rise and follow and clasp my loving may then all my wounds burst open from head and breast out break the gushing blood in torrents and lo i am awake End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Song by Heinrich Heine, translated by Emma Lazarus, read for LibriVox.org by Caroline. Song Death comes, and now I must make known that which my pride eternally prayed to withhold for thee for thee my heart has throbbed for thee alone the coffin waits within my grave they drop me soon where i shall rest but thou marie shalt beat thy breast and think of me and weep and rave and thou shalt wring thy hands my friend be comforted it is our fate 
our human fate the good and great and fair must have an evil end end of poem this recording is in the public domain homeward bound part one by heinrich heine translated by emma lazarus read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. Homeward Bound One In my life, too full of shadows, beamed a lovely vision bright. Now the lovely vision's vanished, I am girt about by night. Little children in the darkness feel uneasy fears ere long, and, to chase away their terrors, they will sing aloud a song i a foolish child am singing likewise in the dark apart if my homely lay lacks sweetness yet it cheers my anxious heart two i know not what spell is o'er me that i am so sad to-day an old myth floats before me i cannot chase it away the cool air darkens and listen how softly flows the rhine the mountain peaks still glisten where the evening sunbeams shine the fairest maid sits dreaming in radiant beauty there her gold and her jewels are gleaming she combeth her golden hair with a golden comb she is combing a wondrous song sings she the music quaint in the gleaming hath a powerful melody it thrills with a passionate yearning the boatman below in the night he heeds not the rocky reef's warning he gazes alone on the height i think that the water swallowed the boat and the boatman anon in this with her singing unhallowed the laura lie hath done three my heart my heart is heavy though merrily glows the may out on the ancient bastion under the lindens i stay below me the calm blue waters of the quiet town moat shine a boy in his boat rows past me he whistles and drops his line in yonder the cheerful colours in tiny figures one sees of people in villas and gardens and cattle and meadows and trees young women are bleaching linen they leap in the grass and ear the mill-wheel rains showers of diamonds its far-away buzz i hear above on the grey old tower stands a sentry house of the town and a scarlet coated fellow goes pacing up and down he toys with his shining musket that gleams in the sunset red presenting and shouldering arms now i wish he would shoot me dead Four. in tears through the woods i wander the thrush is perched on the bough she springs and sings up yonder o oh, why so sad art thou the swallows thy sisters are able my dear to answer thee they built clever nest in the gable where sweethearts windows be five the night is wet and stormy and void of stars the sky neath the rustling trees of the forest i wander silently there flickers a lonely candle in the huntsman's lodge to-night it shall not tempt me thither it burns with a sullen light there sits the blind old granny in the leathern armchair tall like a statue stiff uncanny and speaketh not at all and to and fro strides cursing the ranger's red-haired son with angry scornful laughter flings to the wall his gun the beautiful spinner weepeth and moistens with tears her thread at her feet her father's pointer whimpering crutches his head six when i met by chance in my travels all my sweetheart's family papa mamma little sister most cordially greeted me 
about my health they inquired nor even did they fail to say i was no wise altered only a trifle pale i asked after aunts and cousins and many a dull old boar and after the dear little poodle that barked so softly of yore and how was my married sweetheart i asked them soon they smiled and in friendliest tone made answer she was soon to have a child and i lisped congratulations and begged when they should see to give her the kindest greetings a thousand times for me burst forth the baby sister that dear little dog of mine went mad when he grew bigger and we drowned him in the rhine the child resembles my sweetheart the same old laugh has she her eyes are the same ones over that wrought such grief for me seven we sat in the fisher's cabin looking out upon the sea then came the mist of evening ascending silently the lights began in the lighthouse one after one to burn and on the far horizon a ship we could still discern we spake of storm and shipwreck the sailor and how he thrives and how betwixt heaven and ocean in joy and sorrow he strives we spake of distant countries south north and everywhere and of the curious people and curious customs there the fragrance and light of the ganges that giant trees embower where a beautiful tranquil people kneel to the lotus flower of the unclean folk in lapland broad-mouthed and flat-headed and small who cower upon the hearthstone bake fish and cackle and squall the maidens listened gravely then never a word was said the ship we could see no longer it was far too dark o'erhead eight thou fairest fisher maiden row thy boat to the land come here and sit beside me whispering hand in hand lay thy head on my bosom and have no fear of me for carelessly thou trustest daily the savage sea my heart is like the ocean with storm and ebb and flow and many a pearl lies hidden within its depths below nine the moon is up and brightly beams o'er the waters vast i clasp my darling tightly our hearts are beating fast in the dear child's bosom nestling alone i lie on the sand hearst thou the wild winds rustling why trembles thy foam white hand that is no wild wind sighing that is the mermaid's lay and they are my sisters crying whom the sea swallowed one day ten up amidst the clouds the moon like a giant orange beams o'er the gray sea shining down with broad stripes and golden gleams and i pace the shore alone where the billows white are broken many a tender word i hear words within the water spoken ah the night is far too long and my heart throbs fast for pleasure beautiful undines come forth sing and dance your magic measure take my body and my soul on your lap my head shall rest sing to death caress to death kiss the life from out my breast end of poem this recording is in the public domain homeward bound part two by heinrich heine translated by emma lazarus read for librivox dot org by nemo homeward bound eleven all in gray clouds closely muffled now the high gods sleep together and i listen to their snoring here below to stormy weather stormy weather raging tempest soon the helpless vessel shatters who these furious winds can bridle 
who can curb the lordless waters i can never control the tempest over deck and masthead sweeping i will wrap me in my mantle and will sleep as gods are sleeping twelve the night wind draws his trousers on his foam white hose once more he wildly whips the waves anon they howl and rage and roar from yon dark height with frantic might the rain pours ceaselessly it seems as if the ancient night would drown the ancient sea anigh the mass the sea mew screams with hoarse shrieks flying low its every cry an omen seems a prophecy of woe thirteen the storm for a dance is piping with bellow and roar and hiss hurrah how the ship is tossing what a merry wild night is this a living mountain of water the sea upheaves with might here an abyss is yawning there towers a foaming height and sounds of retching and curses forth from the cabin come and i to the mast close clinging long to be safe at home fourteen the evening shades are falling the sea fog spreads with night mysterious waters are calling there rises something white the mermaid comes from the ocean beside me sitting down her white breast breathing motion i see through the gossamer gown and she doth clasp and hold me in passionate painful way too close thou dost enfold me thou lovely water fay within mine arms i hide thee with all my strength enfold i warm myself beside thee the night is far too cold paler the moon is growing through shadowy vapors gray thine eyes with tears are flowing thou lovely water fay with tears they are not flowing as i from waves did rise forth from the ocean going a drop fell in mine eyes the sea mews moan entreating what does the mad surf say thy heart is wildly beating thou lovely water fay my heart is beating sadly and wild as ever it can because i love thee madly thou lovely son of man fifteen when i before thy dwelling in early morning pace how gladly in the window i see thy gentle face thy brown black eyes in pity mine own eyes wistful scan who art thou and what lacks thou thou strange unhappy man i am a german poet of goodly german fame when their best names are spoken mine own they are sure to name and what i lack sweet maiden most germans lack the same when men name sharpest sorrows mine own they are sure to name sixteen the sea outspread and glorious in the dying sunbeam shone we sat by the lonely fisher's house we sat there mute and alone the waters swell the mist arise the sea mew flutters past and then from out thy loving eyes the tears come flowing fast i see them falling on thy hand upon my knees i sink and from the hollow of thy hand the burning tears i drink since then strange flames my flesh devour my spent soul disappears the wretched woman in that hour poisoned me with her tears seventeen up yonder on the mountain there stands a castle tall there dwelt three beauteous maidens and i was loved by all on saturday hetty kissed me and sunday was julia's day on monday kunigunda nigh hugged my breath away on tuesday in the castle my maidens gave a ball the neighboring lords and ladies 
came riding one and all but i was not invited amazed they all appeared the gossiping aunts and cousins remarked the fact and sneered eighteen upon the far horizon like a picture of the mist appears the towered city by the twilight shadows kissed the moist soft breezes ripple our boats wake gray and dark with mournful measured cadence the boatman rows my bark the sun from clouds outshining lights up once more the coast the very spot it shows me where she i loved was lost nineteen all hail to thee thou fairest in most mysterious town that once enclosed my dearest within thy gateways brown speak out ye towers and portals my sweetheart where is she i left her in your keeping ye should my warders be the towers are not guilty for rooted fast were they when sweetheart with trunks and luggage so quickly stole away the gates gave willing passage with noiseless bars and locks a door will always open when the adorer knocks twenty i tread the dear familiar path the old road i have taken i stand before my darling's house now empty and forsaken oh far too narrow is the street the roofs seem tottering downward the very pavement burns my feet i hurry faster onward end of poem this recording is in the public domain homeward bound part three by heinrich heine translated by emma lazarus read for librivox dot org by nemo homeward bound twenty one here to her vows i listened i tread the empty halls and where her tear-drops glistened the poisoned serpent crawls twenty two the quiet night broods over roof tree and steeple within this house dwelt my treasure rare tis long since i left the town and its people but the house stands still on the self-same square here stands too a man toward heaven he gazes and he wrings his hands with a wild despair i shudder with awe when his face he raises for the moonlight shows me mine own self there o oh, pale sad creature my ghost my double why dost thou ape my passion in tears that haunted me here with such cruel trouble so many a night in the olden years twenty three how canst thou slumber calmly whilst i alive remain my olden wrath returneth and then i snap my chain know'st thou the ancient ballad of that dead lover brave who rose and dragged his lady at midnight to his grave believe me i am living and i am stronger far most pure most radiant maiden than all the dead men are twenty four the maiden sleeps in her chamber where the trembling moonbeams glance without there singeth and ringeth the melody of a dance i will look just once from the window to see who breaks my rest a skeleton fiddles before her and sings like one possessed to dance with me you promised and you have broken your vow to-night is a ball in the churchyard come out and dance with me now the music bewitches the maiden forth from her home doth she go she follows the bony fiddler who sings as he scrapes his bow he fiddles and hops and dances and rattles his bones as he plays his skull nods grimly and strangely in the clear moonlight's rays 
25. I gazed upon her portrait while dark dreams filled my brain, and those beloved features began to breathe again. I saw upon her lips then a wondrous smile arise, and as with tears of pity glisten once more her eyes. Adown my cheeks in silence the tears came flowing free, and oh, I cannot believe it, that thou art lost to me. 26. I, a most wretched Atlas, the huge world, the whole huge world of sorrow I must carry, yea, the unbearable must bear, though meanwhile my heart break in my bosom. Thou haughty heart, thyself hast willed it thus, thou wouldst be happy, infinitely happy, or infinitely wretched, haughty heart, and lo, now art thou wretched. 27. The years are coming and going, whole races are home to their rest, but never ceases the passion that burns within my breast. Only once more would I see thee, and make thee a low salam, and with my dying breath murmur, I love you still, madame. 28. I dream that the moon looked sadly down, and the stars with a troubled ray. I went to my sweetheart's home, the town lies many a league away. My longing led me before her door. I kiss the stone steps brown, that her feet had touched in the days of yore, in the trailing hem of her gown. The night was long, the night was cold, ice cold did the stone steps seem. In the window her own wan face behold, illumined by the moon's pale beam. 29. What means this lonely teardrop that blurs my troubled sight? From olden times returning back to mine eyes tonight, its many glimmering sisters are vanished long ago. In the night and the wind they vanished, with all my joy and my woe. And like the mist of evening, did those blue stars depart, that smiled all joys and sorrows into my trusting heart. Alas, my love, too, melted, like idle breath one day. O lingering, lonely teardrop, thou also fade away. 30. The pale half-moon of autumn, through clouds peers doubtfully, Within the lonely churchyard the parsonage I see. The mother reads in her Bible, the sun at the light doth gaze. One drowsy daughter is nodding, while another speaks and says, Ah me, how dreary the days are, how dull and dark and mean. Only when there's a funeral is anything to be seen. The mother looks from her Bible, nay, only four in all have died since thy father was buried without by the churchyard wall then yawns the eldest daughter i will starve no longer here i will go to the count to-morrow he is rich and he loves me dear the son burst out a-laughing at the star three huntsmen drink deep they are making gold and they promise to give me their secret to keep Toward his lean face flings the mother, her Bible in wrath and grief. Out, God-forsaken beggar! Thou wilt be a common thief. The hearer tap on the window, and behold a beckoning hand. There, in his sable vestments, they see the dead father stand. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Homeward Bound, Part 4, by Heinrich Heine, translated by Emma Lazarus, read for LibriVox.org, by Nima. Homeward Bound, 31. Tonight is wretched weather, it snows and storms and rains, 
Out in the pitch black darkness, I gaze through the window panes. There flickers a lonely candle, slow winding down the street, and a beldam with her lantern goes hobbling on in the sleet. I think tis for eggs and butter that she braves this weather wild to bake a cake for her daughter, her grown up ailing child who lies at home in her armchair and sleepily blinks at the light over her beautiful forehead her golden curls wave bright thirty two they think my heart is breaking in sorrow's bitter yoke i too begin to think it as well as other folk thou large-eyed little darling do I not always say, I love thee past all telling, love gnaws my heart away, but only in my chamber I dare express my pain, for always in thy presence quite silent I remain, for there were evil angels who sealed my lips so close, and oh, from evil angels Spring all my wretched woes. Thirty three. Ah, those pure white lily fingers, once again could I but kiss them, press them close against my heart, melt away in silent weeping. Oh, those clearest eyes of violet hover day and night before me, and I ponder o'er the meaning of those lovely blue enigmas thirty four did she ne'er express compassion for thy tender situation couldst thou never in her glances read thy love's reciprocation couldst thou ne'er surprise the spirit in her bright eyes unawares yet thou surely art no donkey dearest friend in these affairs thirty five they loved one another but neither confessed a word thereof they met with coldest glances though pining away with love at last they parted their spirits met but in visions rare they are long since dead and buried though scarcely themselves aware thirty six and when i lamented my cruel lot you yawned in my face, and you answered not. But now that I said it in daintiest rhyme, you flourish my trumpet all the time. 37. I called the devil, and he came. His face with wonder I must scan. He is not ugly. He is not lame. He is a delightful, charming man. A man in the prime of life, in fact. Courteous, engaging, and full of tact. A diplomat, too, of wide research, who cleverly talks about state and church. A little pale, but that is en regla, for now he is studying Sanskrit and Hegel. His favorite poet is still Fouquet. With the brawls of the critics he meddles no more, for all such things he has given o'er unto his grandmother, Hecate. He praised my forensic works that he saw. He had dabbled a little himself in law. He said he was proud my acquaintance to make, and should prize my friendship, and bowed as he spake, and asked if we had not met before at the house of the Spanish ambassador. Then I noted his features line by line, and found him an old acquaintance of mine. 38 mortal sneer not at the devil life's a short and narrow way and perdition everlasting is no error of the day mortal pay thy debts precisely life's a long and weary way and tomorrow thou must borrow as thou borrowedst yesterday thirty nine three holy kings from the land of the west go asking whoso passes Where's the road to Bethlehem? 
ye gentle lads and lasses but neither young nor old can tell the king's fair patient onward they follow a golden star o'erhead that bright and kind shines downward the stars stand still o'er joseph's house thither the pilgrims bringing the oxen low the infant cries the three wise kings are singing forty my child we too were children as lively as you ever saw we crept into the hen-coop and we hid there beneath a straw and there like cocks crowed loudly while folks went passing by kickery coo they fancied twas really the cock's own cry the chest that lay in the courtyard with paper we overlaid therein we lived together an excellent house we made the old cat of our neighbor would visit us at whiles we gave her bows and curtsies and compliments and smiles after her health we inquired gravely whenever she came to many an ancient tabby since then we have done the same we talked like grown folk sagely and sat there often long complaining how all had altered since the days when we were young how love and faith and friendship had vanished the world was bare how dear were tea and coffee and money had grown so rare those childish games are over all things roll on with youth money the world and the seasons and faith in love and truth and a poem this recording is in the public domain homeward bound part five by heinrich heine translated by emma lazarus read for LibriVox.org by Nima. Homeward Bound 41. My heart is heavy. From the present it yearns towards those old days again, when still the world seemed fair and pleasant, and men lived happily, free from pain. Now all things seem at six and sevens, a scramble and a constant dread dead is the lord god in the heavens below us is the devil dead and all folk sad and mournful moving wear such a cross cold anxious face were there not still a little loving there would not be a resting place forty two as the moon with splendor pierces through the dark cloud veil of night from my darksome past emerges once again a dream of light all upon the deck were seated proudly sailing down the rhine green with june the shores were glowing in the evening sunset shine at the feet of a fair lady sat i full of thoughts untold or her pale and lovely features played the sunlight's ruddy gold lutes were ringing boys were singing wondrous joy on stream and shore blue and bluer grew the heavens and the spirit seemed to soar hill and city wood and meadow glided past in fairy wise and i saw the whole scene mirrored in the lovely lady's eyes forty three in a dream i saw my sweetheart a woman harassed with care faded and haggard and withered the form that had bloomed so fair one child in her arms she carried and one by the hand she led and trouble and poverty plainly in her eyes and her raiment i read across the square she tottered and face to face we stood she looked at me and i spoke then in quiet but mournful mood come home with me to my dwelling thou art pale and ill i think and there with unceasing labour i will furnish thee meat and drink and i will serve thee and cherish thy children so wan and mild 
and thyself more dearly than any, thou poor, unhappy child. Nor will I vex thee by telling the love that burns in my breast, and I will weep when thou diest over thy place of rest. 44. Dearest friend, what may it profit to repeat the old refrain? Wilt thou, brooding still above it, sitting on love's egg remain? Ah, it needs incessant watching. From the shell the chicks have risen. Clucking, they reward thy hatching, and this book shall be their prison. 45. Only bear with me in patience. If the notes of former wrongs many a time distinctly echo in the latest of my songs, wait, the slow reverberation of my grief will soon depart, and a spring of new song blossom in my healed, reviving heart. 46. Tis time that, more sober and serious grown, from folly at last I break free. I, who so long in comedian's gown, have played in the play with thee. The scenes gaily painted were bright to behold, and in ultra-romantic tint shone. My knightly rich mantle was spangled with gold, noblest feelings were ever mine own. But now with grave trouble my thoughts are beset, although from the stage I depart, and my heart is as wretchedly miserable yet as though I still acted my part. Ah, God, all unwitting and holy in jest, what I felt and I suffered I told. I have fought against death who abode in my breast, like the dying wrestler of old. 47. The great king Visvamitra in dire distress is now. He seeks with strife and penance to win Vashita's cow. O oh, great king Visvamitra, O oh, what an ox art thou, so much to struggle and suffer, and only for a cow. 48. Heart, my heart, O oh, be not shaken, bravely bear thy fate once more shall the coming spring restore what the winter rude hath taken how abundant is thy measure still o world how fair thou art and thou yet mayst love my heart everything that gives thee pleasure forty nine thou seemest like a flower so pure and fair and bright a melancholy yearning steals o'er me at thy sight. I fain would lay in blessing my hands upon thy hair, imploring God to keep thee so bright and pure and fair. 50. Child, I must be very careful, for thy soul would surely perish if the loved heart in thy bosom love for me should ever cherish. But the task proves all too easy. Strange regrets begin to move me. Meanwhile, many a time I whisper, if I could but make her love me. End a poem. This recording is in the public domain. Homeward Bound Part 6 By Heinrich Heine Translated by Emma Lazarus. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. Homeward Bound 51. When on my couch reclining, buried in pillows and night, there hovers then before me a form of grace and light. As soon as quiet slumber has closed my weary eyes, then softly does the image within my dream arise. But with my dream at morning, it never melts away, for in my heart I bear it through all the livelong day. 52. Maidened with the lips of scarlet, clearest, 
sweetest eyes that be o oh, my darling little maiden ever do i think of thee dreary is the winter evening with that i were in thy home sitting by thee calmly chatting in the cosy little room and upon my lips my darling i would press thy small white hand i would press and i would moisten with my tears thy small white hand fifty three let the snow without be piled let the howling storm rage wild beating o'er the window-pane i will never more complain for within my heart bide warm springtide joy and sweetheart's form fifty four some to mary bend the knee others unto paul and peter i however i will worship son of beauty only thee kiss me love me dearest one be thou gracious show me favour fairest sun among all maidens fairest maiden under the sun fifty five did not my pallid cheek betray my love's unhappy fate and wilt thou force my haughty lips to beg and supplicate o oh, far too haughty are these lips they can but kiss and jest they speak perchance a scornful word while my heart breaks in my breast fifty six dearest friend thou art in love tortured with new woes thou art darker grows it in thy brain lighter grows it in thy heart dearest friend thou art in love though thou hast not yet confessed i can see thy flaming heart burn already through thy vest fifty seven i fain by thee would tarry to rest there and to woo but thou away must hurry thou hadst too much to do i told thee that my spirit was wholly bound to thee and thou didst laugh to hear it and curtsy low to me yea thou didst much misuse me in all my love's distress and even didst refuse me at last the parting kiss i will not for thy glory go drown when all is o'er my dear the same old story befell me once before fifty eight sapphires are those eyes of thine so lovely and so sweet thrice blessed is the happy man whom thy love will greet thy heart it is a diamond that sheds a splendid light thrice blessed is the happy man for whom it glows so bright as red as rubies are thy lips not fairer can i prove thrice blessed is the happy man to whom they whisper love o oh, knew i but that happy man could i at last discover deep in the greenwood all alone his bliss were quickly over fifty nine lover's vows wherefrom thou turnest bound me closely to thy heart now my jest grows sober earnest i am pierced by mine own dart laughingly thou stand'st before me if thou leave me in my need all the powers of hell come o'er me i shall shoot myself indeed sixty our life and the world have too fragment like grown to the german professor al hai me anon who sets in straight order all things over hurled he will draw up a sensible system i think with his nightcap and nightgown he'll stop every chink in this tumbled-down edifice known as the world and a poem this recording is in the public domain homeward bound part seven by heinrich heine translated by emma lazarus read 
for LibriVox.org by Nemo. Homeward Bound 61. Long through my racked and weary brain did endless thoughts and dreams revolve, but now thy lovely eyes, my dear, have brought me to a firm resolve within their radiance wise and kind where'er thine eyes shine i remain i could not have believed it true that i should ever love again sixty two tonight they give a party the house is all aglow above in the lighted window moves a shadow to and fro thou seest me not in the darkness i stand below apart still less my dear thou seest within my gloomy heart my gloomy heart it loves thee it breaks for love of thee it breaks and yearns and bleedeth only thou wilt not see sixty three i fain would outpour all my sorrows in a single word to-day to the merry winds i would trust it they would merely bear it away they would bear it to thee my darling the world of sorrowful grace thou shouldst hear it at every hour thou shouldst hear it in every place and scarce in the midnight darkness shouldst thou close thine eyes and sleep ere my whispered word it would follow though thy dream were ever so deep sixty four thou hadst diamonds and pearls and jewels all thy heart covets in store and the loveliest eyes under heaven my darling what wouldst thou more upon thine eyes so lovely have i written o'er and o'er immortal songs and sonnets my darling what wouldst thou more and with thine eyes so lovely thou hast stung me to the core and hast compassed my undoing my darling what wouldst thou more sixty five he who for the first time loves e'en rejected is a god he who loves a second time unrequited is a fool such a fool am i in loving once again with no return sun and moon and stars are laughing i am laughing too and dying sixty six they gave me advice they counseled sense they overpowered with compliments patience they said and in my need they'd prove themselves my friends indeed despite their promise to help and protect i surely had perished of sheer neglect had there not come a worthy man who bravely to help me now began oh the worthy man he gave me to eat such kindness as his i shall never forget i long to embrace him but never can for i am myself this excellent man sixty seven this most amiable of fellows ne'er enough can honoured be ah to oysters rhine wine cordial many a time he treated me natty are his hose and trousers Nattier his cravat is seen and he enters every morning asks me how my health has been of my rich renown he speaketh of my charms and wit displayed zealous eager seems he ever to befriend me and to aid and at parties in the evening with inspired brow and eye he declaims before the ladies my immortal poesy how delightfully refreshing nowadays to find still here such a youth when good things surely more and more do disappear sixty eight i dreamt i was almighty god and sat within the sky an angel sat on either side and praised my poetry and sweets and pasties there i ate and drank the best tokay worth many a precious florin bright yet had no bill to pay no less was i nigh bored to death 
and long for earth and evil and were i not almighty god i fain had been the devil thou long-legged angel gabriel make haste be gone from here and hither bring my friend eugene the friend i love so dear within the college seek him not but where good wine inspires and seek him not in hedwig church but seek him at miss myers then spreading broad his mighty wings the angel doth descend and hastens off and brings me back dear bendel my good friend lo youth i am almighty god the earth is my estate did i not always promise thee i should be something great and i accomplish miracles that shall thy homage win to-day to please thee i shall bless the city of berlin behold the pavements of each street now wider broader grown and to an oyster fresh and clear transformed is every stone a shower of sweet lemonade pours down like dew divine and through the very gutters flows the mellowest rhine wine oh how the berlinese rejoice they lush o'er such good fare the councillors and aldermen will drain the gutters bare the poets are in ecstasies at such a feast divine the captains and the corporals lick up the streaming wine the captains and the corporals what clever men are they they think such miracles as these occur not every day sixty nine i left you in the midmost of july to-day my friends in winter i behold then in the heat ye bask so warm and bright but now ye have grown cool yea even cold soon i depart again and come once more then shall i find you neither warm nor cold and i shall moan lamenting o'er your graves and mine own heart shall then be poor and old seventy oh to be chased from lovely lips and torn from lovely arms that clasped as in a dream i fain had stayed with thee another morn then came the postboy with his tinkling team e'en such is life my child a constant moan a constant parting evermore good-byes could not thy heart cling fast unto mine own couldst thou not hold me steadfast with thine eyes and a poem this recording is in the public domain